jQuery also allows us to create custom events for DOM elements, as well as internally defined objects. These events work just like the system generated events, such as click, mouse down, or double click. The browser will handle notification of almost every user interaction we can think of. There are some times, however, when we want notification of some very specialized interaction. In those cases, we can create our own custom event. Custom event handlers can also be attached to objects that aren't part of the DOM. The jQuery method used to initiate a custom event is trigger. It can be used to trigger standard event handlers as well. This can be useful when we want to mimic user interactions and process a click event as if the user had actually clicked an element with the mouse. The needs of a project dictate whether custom events are ever required for DOM elements. For demonstration purposes, we're going to say that we have a need to know when the user has clicked an element three or more times. We'll create a custom event that gets triggered upon the third click and adds a visual highlight to the element. We've removed all the previous event handlers, so we can focus only on our custom events. We've kept a simple click handler attached to verify that regular system events work. The first step in determining when the user has clicked an element three times is to establish a counter for each element and increment the counter upon each click. There's no need to establish counters up front. That would be wasteful because the user may never click anything. We'll create the counter on the first click for each element and keep track of it from there. The best place to keep data associated with an element is in the data object that jQuery exposes with the data method. We can put any kind of information in this object that our application needs. This is a very handy feature that jQuery manages for us, so we'll take full advantage of that. We're expanding the click event handler function. We'll start by getting a jQuery reference to the element that was clicked. That's passed in the this keyword. Next, we get the click count property from the jQuery data object. If it doesn't exist, we default to zero. Then, whatever value is returned is incremented by one. Once we have our incremented value, we store it back to the click count property of the data object for future reference. This value will be persisted across multiple executions of this event handler. It is associated with the element in the DOM, not with the handler function. Finally, we prefix the event type with the click count value when we call the show event message function. Let's see how things work so far in Firefox. With the first click, we see a count of 1 for both the header and the work area div. We see the click for the work area div because it has a clickable class associated with it. Each element that is under the mouse received the click event. When we click the button, that was the first click for that element, but the second click for the div. We see that our counter is incremented properly. When we click the header again, the click counter shows the header has been clicked twice and the work area div has been clicked three times. While clicking all these elements seems as therapeutic as popping bubbles in the plastic wrap used for shipping, we have more to do. With our counter in place, we need to trigger an event when the click counter reaches three. This conditional statement simply triggers a click three event when the click count value is three. What is the click three event? It's a custom event that we've made up. When we use the jQuery trigger method, the click3 event is initiated for the same element that was originally clicked. What is the nature of the click3 event? What does it mean? How does the browser know what to do with it? The nature of the event is no different than a standard system-generated event. It has the same structure and basic properties of any other event. What it means is totally up to us. All we have to do is write an event handler to make use of it. The browser doesn't need to do anything special for this event, and treats it just like any other event in the system. Let's attach a handler for it now. We're using the on method to attach a click3 event handler just like we did with the click event. It will accept an event parameter just like any regular event type. The first thing we do is stop propagation of this event. Why? Because we don't want to process the event for more elements than the one that was originally clicked. If we don't stop propagation, the click3 event will fire for parent elements that are also clickable even when it has processed more than three clicks. Notice that we don't do anything special with the show event message call. This will let us see what the system thinks the event type is. Finally, we add the highlight class to give a visual indication that an element has been clicked three times. Let's check it out. Once we have three clicks on a given element, it will be highlighted in yellow. Look closely at the message area. 
Notice that the first element to receive three clicks was the work area div. Why didn't the entire div turn yellow? The answer lies in how we've defined our CSS rules. The highlight color of yellow is specified in the background color property. The gradient background of the div is specified in the background image property. The order of CSS precedence places a higher priority on the background image than on the background color. This means our work area div will never show the yellow highlight. That's a good thing, however, because we would never see the highlights on the embedded elements otherwise. Let's look at how to apply custom events to objects that are not part of the DOM. We'll look at how to do this. Why you should do this is completely up to the needs of the project. For our example, we're going to create some records in a background process and trigger a custom event when the process completes. There are various ways to accomplish that task, but keep in mind, we're learning about custom events, not researching the best way to perform background processing. First, we'll create an internal object that will hold our records. Within the internal object, we have an empty array for records and a max count value of 5. We'll use the max count property to determine how many records to load. Five records will give us a chance to test the logic without overwhelming us with data once we display it. Next, we need a way to load records into the array we set up. We'll use a simple function to do that. The load record function first gets the length of the array and saves it in an ID variable. This will give us an incrementing ID as the number of records increases. If the length of the array is less than the specified max count value, currently set to 5, a new object consisting of a description and value is pushed onto the array. Once the record has been added to the array, the load record function is called again after a random interval by using set timeout. This approximates an asynchronous process of loading records, perhaps from a database or web service. If the records array already has the maximum number of records, we trigger a custom event called records loaded. Notice how we trigger the event. The trigger method is part of the jQuery library. We create a jQuery object by passing the internal object variable to jQuery. It returns a standard object just as it would if we used a selector. Instead of the object referencing an element on the DOM, it references our internal object variable. Once we have a standard jQuery object, we can use it just like we would in any other case, including triggering an event. Now that we have a record loading process, we need to somehow start that process. We have one actual button on our page, so we'll load the records whenever that button is clicked. Since we know we have only one input type of button, we'll test the type attribute of the element that was clicked. If it's the button, we'll start the load record process. The last thing to do is to listen for our custom event. What should we attach an event listener to? The answer to that is, whatever we triggered the custom event on. Since we triggered the custom event on the internal object, we can also attach an event handler to that object. Notice how we create a jQuery object by passing our internal object to jQuery, just like we did when we triggered the records loaded event. With that jQuery object, we use the on method to attach a handler for the records loaded event. This works in exactly the same way as it does when attaching event handlers to DOM elements. We call the show event message function to display our standard event message. Then we loop through all the records and display the description and value of each record in the messages area. Let's take a look at the result. Our click 3 logic is still in place, so we see the counters as we click the button in paragraph element. After a little delay, we get the result from our custom event. Notice that the click events are processed in pairs just like we've seen in the past. Once the records loaded event fired, we get a list of all the records. The type of the event is the records loaded. What is this unknown text that's displayed? Way back when we first created the show event message function, we checked for the node name of the object that was the target of the event. If the node name was undefined, we defaulted to the text unknown. This has never been an issue up to this point because all of our events have been processed against DOM elements, all of which have a node name property. Our internal object is the target of this event, however and it does not have a node name property. We could extend our internal object to include a node name property. This would allow us to display a message that is more descriptive than just saying unknown. At least we see that our forethought paid off and we're not seeing undefined because we're not trying to reference something that doesn't exist. Before we leave the page, what will happen if we click the button again? Will more records get loaded? 
The first time we clicked the button, there was a perceptible delay from the time we clicked it until the time the records displayed. The records appeared right away. Checking the values of each record shows that we're looking at the same five records that were generated by the first button click. The values were randomly generated, so we can plainly see that the records are the same as before. Also notice that the records loaded event is processed between the two click events. The click event for the button triggered the records loaded event. This event was processed before the click event for the div. When the records don't exist, we use the set timeout function to approximate an asynchronous process. When the records do exist, we just immediately fire the records loaded event. Inspecting this message list, we see that the custom event integrates perfectly into the standard event processing model. That means we could stop propagation, prevent default behavior, remove event handlers, or anything that makes sense in the course of event handling. Our custom event is treated as an equal to system generated events. Custom events are just as easy to support as system events. They fit seamlessly into the standard event processing cycle and have no less standing than any other event. We can attach event handlers to objects that are stored in memory just as we can to objects that are within the DOM. In our example, we used an object that had scope only to our sample page. We could have just as easily used an object defined in the global scope. This would have allowed other libraries or dynamically loaded pages to receive notification of our custom event. Next, we'll learn how to pass parameters with our events.